Oh, welcome to the next talk for EHSM, the second edition. And uh, uh, up next is um, Norbert uh, Braun and Felix Schneider. They're from C4, that's uh, Chaos Computer Club Cologne, and also from uh, Ding Fabrik. Fabrik. Um, and uh, I'm going to let them introduce themselves because they have a nice slide for that. And uh, they're going to talk about two things. Uh, the program just says one, uh, PCB writer, which is about how to make uh, really high-res, high-quality PC boards on your own using photo process uh, with the machine they make. They'll, they'll talk about open source. And also XRP is their main uh, thing they're going to talk about, experimental robot project. Uh, developing controls and algorithms for biped robots. And they've got a bunch of cool stuff to show for that. So take it away. Thank you. Hey. Yeah, thank you for the introduction. Uh, the microphone is on? Yes. yes. Just a little echo. So um, this is. The slide is not complete, so I guess this will be a problem. In the now it's better. Thank you. Thanks. So, um, so I'm going to tell you some things about the PCV Writer project. As was already mentioned in the introduction, this is an open hardware device that lets you expose the photoresist on a PCV um, using a UV laser. And um, I'm going to give you the details soon. Now, first, uh, the introduction. <laughs> Um, but this is Felix Schneider, who hey. is 23 years old. He's an iOS developer at iOS4DE and has a background um, on electronics and mechanics. Yeah, this is Norbert Brown, uh, 32 years old, PhD in nuclear physics and a strong background in electronics. Yeah. So I guess that fits with the location. <laughs> so, um, so why did we uh, build the PCV writer? Um, the idea is uh, that if you want to use modern chips, you've got to deal with things like pitches that are on the order of half a millimeter. And um, in many cases, you just can't get the chips in larger packages. So if you want to have an accelerometer, for example, they are made for mobile phones, and they're just not available in a dip package. So what you have to do is to buy a breakout, which is expensive, which you might not have, which is not available from where you order the chip. So this is a problem. Um, of course, you could just order the PCV from China and save yourself a lot of hassle, but if you're experimenting, then it's really valuable to go through PCV iterations very quickly. So you essentially want to design the PCB and then make it and populate it the same day. Um, so given these two uh, constraints, um, this is how you usually make uh, PCVs. There are two uh, techniques that are in common use. One is toner transfer, and the other is to use uh, laser printer transparencies. Both work relatively well, but the big problem is that the laser printers are not really optimized for the task. So a printer is, of course, made to look good on paper, and they are, in particular, not optimized to print dense. Um, also, the quality depends a lot on the printer make your uh, model you're using. There are not really any reviews that you could consult to learn which printers work and which don't. Um, so what happened is that I tried this, that I tried a uh, toner transfer at university and it worked quite well. Um, then we moved to the Fab Lab and tried it there and it didn't work at all. And essentially it was down to the printer, but we couldn't buy the exact same printer as was used at university, so there was a problem. Similarly, we tried laser printer transparencies, um, and what happened is that there were sm uh, small dots uh, in the PCB traces. So this mostly failed for us. Here is a slide showing the problems. This is toner transfer. And you see that there are really problems where the, where the traces and the pets grow into each other and create short circuits. So this PCB is obviously unusable. You could use a, a knife to just cut it, but then it becomes a lot of work, and if you don't, if you don't catch them all, then um, you're going to fry your electronics. So this is, really, this is not what you want. And similarly, here's an, here's an experiment with using laser transparencies, and as I already mentioned, the printer we used had the problem that it didn't print dense enough. And then you get 
you get tiny holes. And if they happen to lie in the traces, then they can actually break them. This is even harder to debug and fix. So none of these is a problem if you want to do dip parts, of course, and the traces are just large enough. But once you get down to small chips, both of them become very annoying, and uh, you can't really use these methods. So what could we do? Um, the idea is to just take the photoresist and expose it directly without using any form of mask. So we take a UV laser, or actually a deep blue laser, a polygon mirror assembly that, was, uh, that we got from a laser printer, and then we modulate the laser while we scan the beam across the PCB. And the result is that we directly expose the photoresist on the PCB, and then we just go on like you normally would. So we um, develop the photoresist, and then we etch the PCB. Now, this wasn't our idea, really. It's inspired by a similar pro uh, project at the Labor. This is how it looks in practice. Here's the laser. This is still a low-power laser, which we only use to get the electronics working. Here's the polygon mirror. As you see, this comes from a laser printer. Here's the motor driver. And the lenses were later removed. They're just there to show you where the beam goes. Now, um, what are the advantages of a method? First of all, in principle, you can get down to trace width of eight, uh, six to eight mils, which is quite good. You're no longer dependent on the toner or the printer or any other details. You have one step less because you don't actually have to manufacture a mask. Um, also, you don't, have, uh, any you don't have to acquire the supplies. You don't have to uh, get the, the transparencies that work in a laser printer. You don't have to use, uh, you get the special paper which you use for toner transfer and so on. Yeah. So, um, how to construct the device? You can, by the way, you can have a look at the device in the foyer. We brought it with us although we probably won't be turning it on, because as it says here, it contains a laser diode that has 1.6 watts. So it isn't a case. It doesn't have an interlock yet. It probably should. Um, you, you really don't want to get this into your eye, um, which particularly if you, if you plan on copying it, you really need to be careful. We, we did get some laser glasses. Um, so as I said, it's a deep blue laser diode. I took the polygon mirror, which we harvested from a laser printer. Um, we took a linear stage that we got from a flatbed scanner to, take, uh, to, to move the scanned beam over the PCB. Uh, we, we made a homebrew laser bright driver, and the whole thing is controlled by an SDM32 microcontroller. Um, using the SDM32 has a lot of advantages over, say, using an Arduino. Um, the big advantage is, advantage is that the SDM32 has DMA engines. What we can do, we use the hardware SBI engine to, uh, to clock out bytes bit by bit, and we feed them by DMA. So essentially, we st the software starts the scan line, and then is free to do other things until the laser has moved one, one step, for, not one step, for one sixth of the rotation in our case. So um, the, the, the problem is actually that these motors can't really turn slowly. We can't just scan each line only once, because then a the motor would have to turn so slow that it doesn't move smoothly anymore. So instead, we scan each line 80 times, which is not so bad, because as I said, we can use DMA, and the burden on the software is not very high. Um, there's an index diet, just like uh, the laser printer would do it that gets hit by the laser beam directly before it hits the PCB, so we can synchronize the start of the line. Um, also, using the index diet, we can measure the motor rotation speed, and then we implement a simple PI controller to keep the speed constant. On the software side, we use the LibOpen CM3, uh, CM3 um, which comes with a USB stick. So we have two USB, no serial to USB, which means in particular that we have multiple logical channels called, US, uh, called endpoints in USB. Um, also, we have the full speed, which you don't really need, but this implies that you don't really have to use impression, uh, compression. The other project, as so if you want to move the lines over, um, over serial, 
and at some point you're going to start run length encoding, just to just to save speed, uh, just to, yeah, just to get quick enough. Um, of course, that's not really a problem, but we don't have to use it, and it's yeah, it's nice to have two USB. So um, the laser driver which we constructed essentially consists of a fast op amp and, um, uh, and a MOSFET. I'm not going to explain this in a lot of detail, yeah, but essentially here's the current sense resistor and the feedback, uh, the feedback causes the current to stay constant. So this is a constant current source for the laser diode which sits up here. And it's being modulated by actually three inputs. Um, the reason there are three inputs is because we, uh, we drive the laser diode with three different current levels, one for actually exposing the PCB, one uh, idle current, essentially to keep it warm, although of course you don't keep it actually warm, but then it starts faster, and a middle current level um, to hit the index diode. Because we feared that uh, using too high to higher in an intensity would eventually destroy the index diet. So um, yeah, we introduced these multiple current levels. So here is how the hardware looks in practice. Here is the assembly with, uh, with, the, laser, with the laser scanner uh, hot glued on. Up here is the microcontroller and here is the linear stage. Now if you photograph from here, you see the laser beam. And uh, yeah, as, as I explained, it slowly moves in this direction. You place the PCB under here, and it gets exposed. We already had this. I don't know why it's still here. Here you see the laser scanner again with a, with a small diet. This is how the laser driver looks like. Um, the FET, since it's the current source, is operated in linear mode, so it's a large FET with a heat sink. Um, and this is how the PCBs that come out of it look like. This is the tiniest Atmel microcontroller, as the tiniest package for an Atmel microcontroller that we could find. Yeah, and it turned out that it worked as expected. So this is the kind of result you can get. Yeah, this is a, actually a 1.2 millimeter pitch BGA package for a Bluetooth 4 low energy. Um, receiver and uh, it's broken out in one single layer you can see that uh, here two traces go along between the two balls or landing pads for the balls and this is a LGA8 package so no legs and fully pop populated works as expected and uh, quite good quality, but there are problems. Um, probably the, the worst problem is uh, that the motor driver we use has an analog signal or analog input, and as uh, Norbert said before, we use a PD controller to control the speed. Uh, we later found out that there, is, uh, or there are PLL, so phase lock loop motor drivers in laser printers, and uh, for the next uh, evolution or revolution of the um, of the device, we should probably use a PLL uh, motor driver because uh, the timing is really critical. Um, next thing is that our self-made uh, laser driver is not fast enough. Um, we we are on uh, it works up to one megahertz at uh, one amp but uh, that's not quite fast enough and it changes uh, within or the synchronization changes within uh, the duty cycle or if you have a high duty cycle you get better results than with a low duty cycle over a line so it's, it's a bit strange we, not, we are, have not quite understand that but the idea is to maybe buy a ready made uh, laser driver from a German special firm called IC House they sell them for 70 bucks and why why bother uh, another problem is uh, focusing is is difficult we will see that uh, later on um, on the next slide uh, there is a nice example what 
would be possible if the focus is ideal, but uh, as the lag length or the laser beam length differs and the focus is fixed, um, the outer areas of the PCB are a bit, yeah, they, they are not in the focus uh, plane or arc. So uh, one solution would be to, rem uh, to move the, the mirror further up, but uh, you then lose uh, laser power because uh, you, you use less of your arc or of, the, of every swipe. Uh, and at the moment, it was built from scrap, basically. It, what was lying around, the old scanner, the old laser printer, and uh, the documentation for the hardware is a bit yeah, improvable. Uh, software and um, electronics are fully documented and on GitHub, but yeah. And one other problem not within the, the scope of the project is um, what to do with wires, because we have no real solution to do wires in an industrial style. So there are pretty, uh, there are many solutions to, to wires, but none as good as uh, industrial wires. And uh, we try to avoid the hassle of galvanization uh, because the chemicals are expensive and uh, yeah. So in a uh, first try, we just attached the same laser we use now to uh, our portal CNC mill we have at the Fab Lab. And just as a proof of concept, did this board, which is uh, an original uh, four layer um, Spartan 6 board from Dan Strother. And those traces are 4 mil, if I'm not mistaken. And the ball pitch is 1 uh, millimeter. And it, it, it just works. But we cannot do the same uh, size PCB with this um, accuracy on the current device because of the focusing issues. issues. And uh, it, it takes very long, like 4 hours for this board, just uh, the exposure. And um, the, the, we have to dim down the laser as it is too strong. It just burns the photoresist. The, the CNC mill isn't fast enough to, yeah, to use the full laser power. So this is everything about the PCB writer. Thank you very much. You find everything on GitHub. And the device itself is in the hall. We are in the hall. And Just come yeah. and take a look. Yeah. 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 Any questions? Hey. Uh, could you put the audio on the uh, audience mic on? Hello, there we go. Ah. Thank you. Thank you. Um, why not go higher um, power? For I know that uh, there are several uh, PCB uh, printers that ablate the photoresist. It um, just makes the PCB right on. Uh, yeah, one good reason is uh, that we couldn't get our hands on uh, higher power diodes because the diode we use now is about 40 bucks uh, from eBay because they were used in um, in beamers like projectors sorry um, some some kind of Casio uh, projector uses those diodes as a as a light source and they are pretty cheap because they fall somewhere from from the production line <laughs> yeah actually yeah. that has to be the case some faulty devices, whatever, they are scrapped and we have the diets. So this is the only diet that is uh, affordable at the moment. Other questions? Yeah. Um, also, maybe I could add that um, for, the, for the laser scanner device, um, the time it takes to expose the PCB is not really limiting the whole process, because it takes about 25 to 30 minutes to expose a full Eurocard-sized PCB, and it takes about the same time to etch it. So if you go, if you reduce that time to, say, 10 minutes, you don't gain that much. 
the four hours quoted were just for the CNC mill, and there the problem is that you actually have to turn down the laser so that you don't burn the resist. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the microcontroller had uh, something called DMA. Yeah. Could you explain what that is? Uh, DMA is called direct memory access, and it's basically exactly that. Uh, some hardware peripheral has direct memory access. You write something in the in the memory, say, "Hey, SBI engine, there's your starting point. Please feel free to write out anything you find there. Say when you're ready." Or done. Yeah, a and that frees up a lot of uh, computing power and saves you timing issues because of interrupts or whatever. Hi. Um, did you consider using an F FPGA for the timing critical stuff? Or was that not even a consideration yet? Um, so no, we didn't really consider it. Um, essentially for the reason that since we have the DMA engines, you don't you, you actually, the timing for scanning out the line is essentially in hardware. So there's not much that would cause it to jitter. So um, I think the FPGA would necessarily improve the situation. Um, also, um, you need a microcontroller anyway to talk via USB. So then you'd have a microcontroller and an FPGA. Yeah, um, well, you could put the microcontroller into the FPGA. Yes, of, sure. course. of course. You could. The SDM32 uh, th uh, is example. 12 to 14 dollar. Yep. So, uh, as of development board. So, it comes with everything, including a JTAG uh, debugger that is usable by GDB or whatever for $14. Okay. Why bother with, a, with an FPGA? Okay. <laughs> Thank you. No problem. Any further questions? You said you, you, you sourced your uh, laser uh, on eBay, uh, simply. Uh, uh, there are many uh, models of uh, UV uh, lasers uh, avail available, or? Uh I don't think there are many models. There is essentially this model coming from the Casio projector uh, engine, yeah. but they are always up, so if you want to get one, go to ebay.com and search for a uh, high power blue laser or whatever, then you usually find, find them. But I don't think there are more than two or three possible models of laser, because they all seem to come from this particular application. Only uh, har harvested from uh, Casio yes. project? So they are either harvested or as Felix said, they possibly they just drop off the assembly line. Okay. Uh, but um, so, uh, this is a stupid question. Uh, uh, the the wa wavelength of the emitted is uh, truly U UV or no? It, it, it is deep blue. You can see it very well. It's 440. Five okay. nanometers. So it is. Uh, I, it is uh, at the frontier between uh, exactly. exactly deep blue and uh, UV. Yeah. Okay. If you look in the data sheet uh, for the PCBs, however, you'll see that the uh, response curve for the photoresists actually includes this region. So um, again, we wouldn't gain too much by using true UV. Uh, uh, I'm not uh, speaking about uh, photoresist and. Uh, um, um, yeah, the, the data was for yeah, the yeah. diet. The, the 445 m nanometers are the specs of the diet. Uh, no, uh, speaking about the um, material for PCB, the, the plate, the, uh, the ta tapered uh, plated board, uh, this is a normal uh, ta tapered uh, plated board. Uh, a copper plated board, <laughs> excuse me, I don't uh, know the... Yeah, you use a standard coated standard PCB, 
uh, or Kappa PCB. And uh, as Norbert said before, the specs from our man PCB manufacturer says uh, that the 445 uh, nanometer range is included in the. So, so, the, um, so, um, so there is no need for a special board. Uh, no. No, yeah. just standard just coated standard, board. Just uh, standard about uh, at Mauser or another. Exactly. Yeah. Thank you. And, and you do your own photo resist uh, <laughs> no. on it, right? No. You, you put your own f uh, photo resist on it? Or no, we, we uh, buy pre-coated uh, oh. PCBs usually, but you can use your own positive photo resist as well, okay. or negative, however you like. Turns out that, uh, that the laser transparency method is so common that coated uh, PCBs actually cost about the same as bare PCBs. Why bother? So, um, so somewhere on the internet, I've seen a video of some hack space in the US actually coating their PCB with black paint and then using a laser cutter to etch away part of the paint so that they then could etch uh, these parts, you know, basically creating their own resist. Uh, what do you think about this method? Is it feasible with what you've built, uh, or is it comparable in some way, uh, um, especially about the resolution? I think re resolution-wise it's comparable as soon uh, or as long as you resist, in this, uh, in this uh, case, the black paint. Uh, burns fine enough, and yeah, that's uh, everything. But we wouldn't gain any advantage because we scan everything at the moment. And uh, this approach is, is a good approach if you uh, have a router and just attach the laser, and then you do like isolation milling. But yeah, uh, we wouldn't gain anything because we scan anything anyhow in this principle. Any further questions? Okay, next talk then. <laughs> okay. Thanks. So next up, the experimental robot project. Same guys. Yeah. Uh, so actually, we planned to uh, do this one before the other one. So the introduction was actually in there, and we just copied over one slide. Well, blah blah blah. So I I will introduce you to our makerspace or Fab Lab or whatever in Col uh, in Cologne called Dingfabrik. Um, yeah, founded in 2010. Uh, at the moment, approximately 90 members. Uh, we, have, we are moved to a new uh, cellar uh, location with 450 square meters and have a fully fledged wood, wo wood workshop and a metal workshop that is in the making. So, yeah, just a few specs. We have a, a self made uh, laser cutter, uh, two, uh, 1,200 by 600 millimeters working area uh, based on the Laser Sour project. Yeah, and everything you need in a wood workshop. Uh, the metal workshop is yeah, pretty good equipped when it comes to welding. Uh, we have a drill press, a nice conventional milling machine, but no sheet metal, uh, no saws, and um, yeah, we have bought a, li a lathe, but uh, it has to be moved to the new cellar location, and yeah, quite difficult to move in heavy equipment. Um, this is the uh, milling machine we are using. It's uh, built in 1978 and was donated by a company called SGL Carbon, famous for doing 
carbon uh, um, resources, uh, e.g. Uh, for, for um, wind generators or the new BMW i-series, uh, all that stuff comes from SGL. Uh, we overhauled the machine this year, and it's a pretty small res uh, um, uh, working area, but pretty good, a good exalt, uh, result, sorry. And yeah, we have uh, electronics uh, guys that, uh, yeah, with, with a scope and whatever you need for electronics and um, 3D printing is there as well. Uh, yeah, you just need to have it in a maker lab. <laughs> and, and then we have a 20 square meter room for ourselves, um, yeah, which is fully equipped with electronics stuff and um, there's something missing on the bottom of the slide. Yeah, uh, it's a pity, but yeah, whatever. So, to the main project, uh, experimental robot project. The project, uh, project goal is obviously creating a humanoid robot, a life-sized humanoid robot that is able to walk. Yeah, so focuses on the legs, arms, and the torso, and whatever comes later. Um, the, the hardware should be on a fully free open source license and the development process, uh, yeah, we have a block and from time to time we have posts, but not that many. Uh, and the goal is to keep it cheap because, yeah, uh, there are human and robot projects, but they are neither open source nor cheap. So, yeah. Why humanoids? The real reason they are cool, the other stuff. I mean, the, the world as we know it is, is made for biped walkers. We have stairs and whatever. I mean, the world as we shape it is made for humans. And uh, yeah, you all know the disaster recovery uh, um, uh, Scenario like some atom plant, nuclear plant, and uh, doors and stuff they cannot be opened by by weird robots, or the, the the weird robots cannot go about uh, over debris and stuff. Yeah. So other projects I mentioned it before. Existing robots are darn expensive, and for the the big ones like every one Google bought this year or in the last year like Boston Dynamics and Shaft, uh, they don't even public, uh, publish uh, papers, like scientific papers, nor any other documentation. And, uh, but the, the, the whole uh, scene is extremely vibrant at the moment. Uh, every other week you read something about Google bought someone or uh, some new project and some new project, uh, progress. And uh, the other thing we noticed is that Apparently, the hardware makers don't talk to the software makers because you see uh, videos from ZigGraph, especially from uh, yeah, extremely old videos that look very good, but the the um, robots can't do that. I I don't know exactly why. So back to Norbert. So, um, so in the next. Uh couple of minutes, I'm going to tell you a bit about how to simulate a robot. Because um, that's obviously a first step. If for you build something, you need to have at least some data on what you need, for, especially uh, with regards to joint torques, joint velocities, and so on. Also, having a simulation will allow you to um, simulate all kinds of errors and estimate um, how bad they are going to influence the performance of the final robot. Also, I mean, simulation costs nothing. So rather than spending, I don't know, several thousand euros on building something that doesn't work, it's probably a good idea to simulate it first. So what do we do? We try to simulate our robot using simplified physics models. Um, yeah, the goal is, of course, to, to develop controllers, uh, to evaluate the actuation requirements, I already said that, and then to de uh, inform design choices. So what we use is uh, the Open Dynamics engine, which some of you might know. It's really intended for games, but it does an okay job for our purposes. And we've also started um, to develop uh, dedicated algorithms. 
or rather implement uh, the algorithms are from other people. So how do you simulate a robot? Um, the basic physics primitive is a so-called rigid body. This is a body which is assumed to be non-deformable, so it can't flex, vibrate, or anything. This simplifies its motion quite a lot. In particular, the mass distribution stops to matter, and it condenses into 10 parameters. Um, you can think of a rigid body like um, an ellipsoid, as shown here. So the shape doesn't matter. Um, now, if you wanted to go further in realism, you end up with a so-called soft body. For this, the complete details of the mass distribution and sh uh, stiffness and so on matter. Um, also, it has an infinite amount of degrees of freedom. Um, this is a picture from Wikipedia of an I-beam, um, which is flexing. So simulating these is computationally much, much more expensive than simulating rigid bodies. And also, do you have to know many more parameters. So for the first step, it makes sense to concentrate on rigid bodies only. No, this can't work, sorry. Um, I need a five-minute break. Um, somehow it messed up completely. Um, why is this sorry for that. Sorry for that. It, it probably won't work either, but I'm, yeah, I'm going, just going to stand here and scroll by hand. I guess that's the best solution for now. So um, I'm done with the, uh, so this was the soft body. So we are going to use rigid bodies in any way. Now, um, how does the rigid body move? Um, as I said, the mass distribution condenses into 10 parameters. The total mass, its center of gravity, and the so-called moment of inertia. Also, it has six degrees of freedom, which essentially means if you take a rigid body, it can translate in space like this, this, and this, and it can rotate about three axes. This one and this one. So, um, now the, um, the physics that describes the so called Newton Euler equation, which gives a link between the force applied on the rigid body, its velocity, and the resulting acceleration. Um, this looks similar to the F equals M times A, you might remember from school, except that the force is now six-dimensional because there are six degrees of freedom. And more importantly, the velocity, in particular the angular velocity, now matters. So how do we... Um, so the, the, other, the, the other ingredient to the robot is joints. Joints enforce constraints between rigid bodies. The idea is shown in this picture. If you have two rigid bodies connected by a joint, in this case a sliding joint, um, they, yeah, the, 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 uh, the centers of the rigid bodies have to stay on the same line. Now if I apply a force on the outer rigid body, that is consistent with the constraint, then its motion is unaffected. If I push this ring up, it moves as if the red body wasn't there. On the other hand, if I push it sideways, then these two move as a whole. What is happening is that there is a so-called constraint force. The constraint force is chosen by nature such that the resulting accelerations cause the constraint to remain fulfilled. So for my example, I push on the ring. The red body exerts a constraint force on the ring, causing it to accelerate slower than it would normally do. And the ring exerts um, a constraint force on the rod, causing the rod to accelerate as well. The result being that these two move as a whole. 
Now for robots, of course, we want an actuated joint to model a motor. And for the actuated joint, the force in the active direction, which is the direction in which I can move, can be chosen. So if this was an actuated joint, I could apply a force in this direction that comes from my controller, but I'd still have the constraint force. Now in a typical physics engine, such as ODE, you're going to be simulating all six degrees of freedom per body. So for this double pendulum example, you're going to have 12 degrees of freedom. Um, now this is of course a bit redundant, because really only that, all that matters are these two angles. Um, so it makes sense to consider only the active degrees of freedom for each joint. So these are restricted to only rotate about this point and this point. So I have two so-called joint degrees of freedom. But the question is now, how do the equations of motion look like? Um, this is being done, or this question is being answered by the so-called recursive Newton-Euler algorithm, which applies to kinematic trees. Um, we assume that there is a tree-like structure of rigid bodies connected by joints, and that there are no loops. Also, the root of the tree is supposed to be connected to the solid ground. Um, as you can see, it uh, only has a limited relevance to robots, and I'm going to discuss this point in more detail later. Essentially, what this recursive Newton-Euler algorithm does is to give inverse dynamics for kinematic trees. Inverse dynamics means that I, uh, that I choose a velocity and an acceleration in joint space. So that would be two velocities and two accelerations for my double pendulum example. And it calculates joint space forces, torques for the double pendulum, that are needed to achieve them. Also, it allows for external forces, and it achieves these, uh, these accelerations despite the presence of these external forces. This is useful because it allows for gravity compensation. So I can take my robot, calculate what torques would be needed to counteract gravity, and still make it move in the way I want it to move. How does the algorithm work? It's, um, there are three passes. The first pass uh, consists of calculating the rigid body velocities and accelerations from the joint space positions, velocities, and accelerations. So I start here. The velocity and accelerations of the inertial frame are obviously zero. And as, then as I move across this joint, I know the velocity and acceleration happening on this joint, so I can calculate this velocity and acceleration. Then I add the velocity and acceleration due to this joint, and so on, until I have reached the leaves of the tree. Now in the next step, I use the Newton-Euler equation to calculate the total force that has to be acting on each rigid body. Simple enough, since I know velocity and acceleration. Then in the backwards pass, remember that the external force is supposed to be given. So I start at the leaves of my tree. The total force acting on this body, which I know, is given by the sum of the external force and the force transmitted through this joint. Therefore, I can solve for F3. So I know the force transmitted through this joint. Now, from the point of view of this rigid body, the same force is transmitted, just opposite in direction. Then again, I have the total force on body number two, which I know is the sum of the external force, plus F2, which I don't know, minus F3, which I just calculated, and so on. So I can also solve this. And then I know the forces transmitted through each joint. Now, this is the sum of the active forces and the constrained forces. Then I have to project them to get the joint space forces tau. This, as you can see, runs in time O of n because I go down once and then up again. It allows me to calculate the constraint forces. This is quite useful because it allows me to size bearings and so on. Because I actually know I, 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 can't, I can size not only motors but also bearings because I know how much force the bearings will be subject. 
by analysis in more detail, uh, it turns out that the, the, the resulting joint space force is linear in the accelerations. And I get this kind of equation where M of Q is called the so, is the so called mass matrix, and uh, C groups all the terms that are independent of QD dot. The mass matrix is symmetric and positive definite and therefore invertible. This is useful because now I can get back to the simulation problem. So inverse dynamics was the task of finding the forces required to produce a certain acceleration. Forward dynamics is simulation. I take my joint space torques and I calculate the resulting acceleration, which I then integrate numerically to obtain uh, the movement. Now this, because there's a matrix inversion, is computationally not no longer quite so cheap, but there are all of n algorithms for this problem also. But I guess, uh, guess that's enough. So um, here's a nice book which covers essentially this and much more. And if you're really interested, you can just look it up. So what, uh, what have I got? Um, now that I have R and E and have implemented it for my robot, I can do trajectory tracking as long as I have a, kinet a kinematic tree. So trajectory tracking means I decide on a joint space trajectory. So for the robot, I don't know, decide how this joint, for example, should be moving. And then I can calculate um, the torques required to achieve this. Now, in principle, if I were to apply these torques, it should move exactly um, exactly like the desired trajectory gives, but in reality, of course, I have model errors. So I add to this so-called feed-forward term a simple, a, a small PD controller, which in theory does, uh, which in, yeah, it in principle does nothing, but in reality corrects the modeling errors. Um, so again, remember, this is for kinematic trees only. Let's do something with this. As I said earlier, this does not apply to a real robot. So let's imagine I had a robot with magnetic boots. So what I mean is that the robot is, it walks on iron floor, and I imagine that it could just lock its feet to the ground. So it has magnets in its feet. You can't, of course, build that, but that's not the point at the moment. So you assume um, it can lock its feet to the ground, and then it turns into a kinematic tree. So this means that the uh, algorithms can be applied. So I can just design joint space trajectories and track them. For the record, this is, this is exactly what a 3D animator would do. If you want um, to make a 3D movie of a person moving, then you don't really usually bother with physics. So you just design some realistic looking trajectory and have your 3D uh, program play it back. No physics involved at all. Um, and I can try to do the same thing. So I designed some joint space trajectory because I'm not a 3D animator, it won't look too good, and then I just try to track them. But unlike the 3D community, I am actually going to run this uh, through uh, ODE. So there is physics, but essentially, yeah, so here it is. So let's play that back. Notice my robot moving. Um, yeah. Maybe again, I don't know. So short. No, never mind. Oh, no, I don't know. So there's again. So it doesn't look too good, as I said. But that's not the real problem. The real problem is these magnetic boots. Um, let's go back to the talk, which is somewhere here. So what have I done? I mean, essentially, I haven't really achieved anything. Because all I have done is to show that uh, my implementation of the RNE algorithm and the algorithm used by ODE agree. Because what I do is I decide on a trajectory I want to track, then I calculate the torques, then, I, then ODE takes these torques, turns them into a trajectory, integrates them, and if the algorithms agree, and the, 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 uh, what goes in comes out. So more interesting is, of course, the question, what if we don't have magnetic boots? If we just assume this approach works, 
maybe we, we are optimistic and say maybe it works even if I get rid of my magnetic boots and simulate actual shoes. So, um, Fortunately, it doesn't work. In fact, it fails so hard that ODE uh, exits with an error. I can still show you uh, what happens, though. It was very quick. The thing just, <laughs> the thing just falls over in a comic way. Um, let's take a closer look from another perspective. I guess from here you should see it quite well. Um, yeah. So essentially, the foot just loses contact with the ground. So it turns out that we need the magnetic boots. Since we cannot build them, uh, we haven't uh, achieved much yet. So let's go on and talk about contact. Because this will hold the key um, to how to solve this problem. Now the defining thing about contact is that contacts are usually non-sticky. Um, let me explain this in a series of simple pictures. If I place something on top of a table, then it stays there, which means that the resulting force on it is zero. And it is zero because the contact forces exactly counteract the attraction due to gravity. So the resulting force is zero. Now if I try to lift it up and pull just a little, then there is a force that tries to pull it up, and uh, the contact force just counteracts the rest, so that the resulting force is still zero the case where I just pull very softly. If there was a scale underneath it, I'd, uh, I would notice it getting lighter. And then finally, if I pull strong enough, then the contact force is zero, the force upwards is larger than the force due to gravity, and the resulting force is non-zero, causing an acceleration. So this is essentially the, the, the defining feature of contacts. The normal component of the contact force is greater than zero, or smaller than zero if you look from the other coordinate frame. Now there's also the tangential component, um, which is much more complicated, because contact in reality is a complicated microscopic phenomenon. Um, you might remember from school the so-called Coulomb friction model, which just says that, uh, that the norm of the tangential force is small or equal to a parameter mu times the, the normal component of the contact force. Now this gives rise to this so-called friction pyramid, where the total contact force has to lie within this cone. Um, for rubber salts on ground like this, you can convince yourself that mu is on the order of one. However, it turns out, and we've seen that in the video, um, that this isn't really the failure mode we are after. So this failure mode for the robot would imply that it slips, like a person walking on wet ice. But this is not what happens. What happens is that the feet uh, start to rotate around their edge. And it turns out that for humanoid walking on, let me say, normal ground, uh, the tangential component uh, of the contact doesn't matter that much. So. Um, So, um, until now, we've been talking about point contacts. Now we need to go on and consider multiple points of contacts. Um, so, let's assume I have rectangular feet. That's an okay approximation to make. And let's furthermore assume that they make contact with the ground only in the outer corners. It turns out, and I won't explain it, that this is actually sufficient. So uh, this is an assumption you can actually make. Now for each contact, you again have normal force and a tangential force. What I can now do is to define the so-called center of pressure. And this is the weighted mean of all the contact points. And it's weighted by the relative strength of the normal force. So, again, here are the four contact points. Um, 
and I just take all four contact points, multiply them with some alpha, where alpha is the relative strength of the normal force, and um, yeah, add them up. And I get this uh, center of pressure. Now, the fun thing is that since the contact normal force is always positive, this implies that these alphas must lie between 0 and 1. And this means that this is, mathematically speaking, a so-called convex sum, which means that the center of pressure always has to lie, for our example, inside this rectangle. Even if you don't know what a convex sum is, I guess it should be relatively obvious if you take these points, weigh them with numbers between 0 and 1, and uh, add them up, then you can't really get a point here. How could you? Um, yeah. So this is the center of pressure. Now, the reason why the center of pressure is enjoys a great popularity in robotics is because you can calculate it without knowing the contact forces. So let's suppose you sum all contact forces into a total contact force, and uh, this is supposed to say torque. So you take the total contact force and the total contact torque. And then you can calculate the center of pressure by this, uh, by this expression. And this makes it useful, because now I don't have to worry about the details of contact anymore. Again, um, let's, let's talk about our magnetic boots example. Now, the magnetic boots can transfer arbitrary contact forces. But um, if I am supposed to replace the magnetic boots by ordinary boots, then uh, the center of pressure condition must be fulfilled. Um, it turns out, by the way, that the center of pressure is only a necessary condition for physical contact. It's sufficient if I let this parameter mu from Coulomb friction go to infinity, and it's usually sufficient in practice. Um, now, I've introduced the uh, recursive Newton Euler algorithm, and this allows me to calculate the force that is being transmitted through my magnetic boots. And I can throw it into the above equation and calculate the center of pressure. And now the dashed lines indicate the limits of my feet. And now you see exactly why it fails. Because the center of pressure is way outside the foot. And if the center of pressure is outside the foot, then it just causes the foot to rotate about the edge. And now if the foot feet are sticky, then this doesn't matter. But as long as soon as I have real boots, um, yeah, the robot fails or falls. Um, now, what I can now do is just to try to design a trajectory, calculate the center of pressure, and see if it works. So I could just try to solve my problem by trial and error. This is relatively hard to do. I mean, in this magnetic boot example, I didn't try at all, but even if you try, it's it's surprisingly hard. So let's do something else and get to actual walking. The first controller I'm going to talk about is called Cartwheel 3D. It's from a SIG graph, actually. So it's a physics-based an character animation framework, meaning that it uses the physics engine internally. It's not just animation, it's trying to, to do physics. So it's potentially useful for our purposes. Um, it's, it's been designed by these guys, and it's it's open source, which is nice because we can directly work with it. It was originally intended for interactive authoring and not to control hardware, so they have never really tried to, uh, to control a robot with this. Still, um, we could have a look. So this is the biped um, they are using has six degrees of freedom per leg, three in the hip, one in the knee, and two in the ankle. This means that the position and the rotation of the foot can be complete, can be fully controlled. Um, also, I can do this analytically. So I can calculate how the joint angles have to be to achieve a certain position and rotation for my foot. Um, yeah, for the experts, one could add that there is a kinematic singularity for the fully extended leg, but that doesn't matter a lot. This is, by the way, the reason why you sometimes see bipedal robots work like this. 
because they are trying to avoid the kinematic singularity that would result if the legs were fully extended. Originally, the controller had additional degrees of freedom in the upper body, um, but we don't need them, so we removed them for now. Here's how it looks like. I already told you that. Yeah, so how does this work? Um, it regulates the uh, center of mass velocity with a simple PD controller. Um, for this, it uses a so-called virtual force. Um, the idea is that if I can move well, if my foot is on the ground, and if I can move the foot in any way I want, I can in particular simulate the effect of applying a force. So um, if my foot is on the ground, I could simulate the effect of applying um, a force on the center of mass of the robot. This is called a virtual force. I won't go into detail how to calculate that. Anyway, it, uh, it applies a virtual force on the center of mass to regulate the center of mass velocity. For this, it uses a simple PD controller, which will sometimes go overboard, causing the center of pressure constraint to be violated. Um, so I clamp the controller and just let it not exert more force than the foot can at the situation afford. The result is then that I have relatively poor control over the center of mass, another typo, sorry, over the center of mass trajectory. But what I can then do is to use, just like humans do it, um, the swing foot position to compensate for that. So everyone knows if I walk like this, that if I get pushed, then I make a step like this. And the robot does the same thing. So let me show you that. This is a simplified version of the Cartwheel 3D controller. So we ripped out all the interactive author authoring stuff and just reduced it to the their controller, the cleanly separated controller and physics engine, which was not important for the original purpose, but obviously is for our purpose. And it is using and was using ODE, the Open Dynamics Engine. So, um, here it is. And this is now real physics, so there is no longer any magnetic boots involved. I have real boots walking on simulated real ground, and it works surprisingly well. Also, it looks a lot more realistic um, than, than my earlier attempt looked. And this is arguably, arguably because we humans recognize physically correct motion. This looks relatively elegant. So in theory, or rather in simulation, we have a controller that could work. Um, the problem is that no one has really ever tried this, kind, uh, this exact controller on a physical robot. So this is unclear. The other problem is that I've just lost control over the swing foot position. And if I'm trying to climb stairs, this is quite important. So if I'm trying to climb stairs, then I'd have a high-level controller that tells me where to put the swing foot. But I've just lost that possibility because the swing foot positioning is already used by the low-level controller. So this works very well on even ground, but it's going to get rough on more extreme ground. Also, a minor point is that trying to keep the center of mass velocity constant rather than just letting it increase and decrease naturally based control effort. But this is not a big concern. The, the, the larger concern is really the second point, that I just lost control over my swing foot positioning. Now here's another kind of approach. This is actually based on a physical robot. So at TU Munich, they built a very impressive robot called Lola. And there are actually two, so on their homepage, they have fairly little information, just a video, not much else. But there are two PhD theses where um, the controller and the physical construction of the robot is described in great detail. That was very useful to read them. Here's the PhD thesis, if you want to read it as well. Unfortunately, they don't, they don't publish any code. So our implementation is work in progress. Um, 
Still, I'm going to, this is the last theory slide, by the way, so <laughs> don't leave. Um, so um, the important concept here is as follows. Suppose the robot was floating in space. Then you know from school physics that linear and angular momentum are conserved. As a conservation of linear momentum implies that the center of mass trajectory cannot be influenced, but this is not true for the reorientation. Think of a cat, by example. Suppose a cat falls out of a tree. The cat cannot influence its center of mass trajectory, so it's going to hit the ground at some point with a certain velocity. And there's not much it can do about it. But it can reorient itself, so it can influence its, re or its orientation trajectory. Um, now, once the robot is on the ground, um, the same thing kind of applies. Um, it is the total linear and angular momentum can now be influenced because it's no longer a closed system. There are external forces. Uh, these external forces are transmitted though, th through the foot, though. Um, yeah, so we, we, can, we cannot really control linear and angular momentum directly, but we can control the contact forces through the foot. And therefore, we can also control our total linear and angular momentum. Now, the car, the Bushman controller, uses this as follows. First of all, it makes the assumption that the angular momentum is constant, just to simplify things. It then chooses a center of pressure trajectory. So it says, I want to place my, my feet here, here, and here. And uh, then I can design a center of pressure trajectory that is compatible with that. If the center of pressure always has to be inside the foot. If I'm stepping on two feet, it has to be in the convex so-called convex uh, hull of the two feet. So once I have chosen my center of pressure trajectory, I can solve a so-called boundary value problem to obtain the center of mass trajectory. And then I just design the rest of my robot movements around the center of mass trajectory. Here's how it looks in our implementation. The blue line is the center of pressure trajectory we have chosen, and the green line is the center of gravity trajectory that is being, cal that is being calculated and uh, will result in this center of pressure trajectory if it is executed on the robot. Now, the long-term prospect, as we said at the very beginning, is optimization-based controllers. So handcrafted controllers are okay for walking. On, on, on certainly on, uh, on even ground, possibly even on slightly, com slightly uh, complex ground. But for complicated movements, like you know, you see this for artists or something, uh, this breaks down. So an alternative approach is to design the movements using large-scale numerical optimization. This is interesting because it gives us an advantage over researchers, say, 20 years ago. This is a good way to use the massive computational power that we have available today. And now, most of the spectacular SIG graph results come from this. So a lot of people are doing this, but, always, but usually only offline, because they're interested in animation. They don't really do this for control yet. Yeah, and again, we could ask the question, why is no one doing this on physical robots? There appear to be a few people who are doing this on physical robots, but not a large community, I think. I mean, of course, it is more difficult on physics than it is in simulation, but still, it seems like a very promising approach. Anyway, um, yeah, so this is the long-term long outlook. So mm. now, um, yeah. So that's for the theory part, and now we come to the thoughts about uh, how to actually build the thing. Exactly. So before talking about other robots, uh, we will talk about gear requirements. Uh, so from the simulations and the other robots, we know that we need peak joint torques about in the, in the range of 100 Newton meters. That is pretty high. So, oh, this should be a tilt, but whatever. Uh, we, our motors have something around one Newton meter. So we need a gear to get a reduction of uh, approximately 1 to 100. So 
uh, there are not that many gear options left, and I introduce you to the gear options we have. So this is an harmonic drive. Um, it's a pretty expensive gear that works by that works by having a an ellipse thing called wave generator in a flex spline. This was the this is the flex spline, sorry, the flex spline, the wave generator, the circular spline. So we bent the circle uh, the flex spline with the wave generator and move the flex spline then in the, the circular spline. Blah, whatever. We don't bother about ratios at the moment, but it's pretty good and it has no back leash. So next uh, thing is a planetary gear. Planetary gears are pretty common, but very complex because you can build, uh, so they, they consist about mainly three parts. Uh, the sun here green, uh, the planets blue, and the annular gear here red. But uh, you can build mixers and whatever with this, so the ratios achievable with this are, are from 1 to 1 to 1 to 500. Problem with this is uh, as you add more stages, um, the, the backlash increases and the efficiency decreases. Now, this is just a very quick overview of, to, to uh, understand the next stuff coming. So linear actuators, they're basically working like screws. So you, you uh, have a rotation, and the movement you achieve is uh, a translation. So what is left as an option for us is ball screws, which work like a normal screw, but don't have the normal screw sides, but a ball bearing balls. Uh, they reduce friction, like in ball bearings, and you don't have any self-locking. That means, uh, unlike a normal screw, if you, the, the, if you hold it like this, the, the uh, ball nut would just run down by itself by gravity. A more complicated a uh, variant of this is a roller screw, so-called roller screw. Um, they are darn expensive, but they are resistant to shocks, which is important in robotics, and they uh, uh, support really heavy loads uh, with a really, really low weight. So, quick comparison about gearings. Planetary gears uh, are, aren't that good for higher speeds than harmonic drives. Efficiency of planetary gears is actually better than with harmonic drives, but you have backlash, a backlash, uh, and they, yeah, the weight planetary uh, um, gears are pretty heavy. This, all this plays a role when we are talking about other robot projects that are documented. So for one, this is Tulip. Tulip is uh, from TU Delft, Eindhoven and Twente. Um, it's a pretty small robot, one meter twenty, and but it only weighs fifteen kilograms. So they use pretty small motor and gearing uh, concept and a, a trick called serious elastic actuation, which means that they uh, have springs in all their uh, actuation uh, to um, to avoid spikes and to uh, save energy. Um, like Norbert said before, uh, they use six degrees of freedom uh, in per leg, two degrees, uh, three degrees in the hip, one in the knee, and two passive ones. Uh, sorry, one passive one in the ankle and one active one in the in the ankle. So the the bending in this direction is active, but in this direction is just feather, uh, springs. Sorry. Um, Lola was talked about before. Lola is uh, developed at TU Munich, 180, uh, 180 centimeters, 55 kilos, so pretty big robot, and uh, 
they actually bothered to add arms and a hat and whatever. Uh, the predecessor of Johnny Walker is called uh, of, of Lola is called Johnny Walker and looks pretty good as well. And uh, both of them are documented, which is uh, the exception, not the rule, unfortunately. The actuation concept of Lola is, is pretty interesting because they use the the roller screws we introduced before for the knees and for the ankles. This is the motor. This is a roller screw, and they, they use it like hydraulics. Um, so th this um, enables them to get rid of the expensive gearing and replace it with an even more expensive roller screw. <laughs> uh, so um, the kinematic concept is actually the same than, um, than, uh, than with Tulip, but they added a toe joint. So a tulip has flat foot and Lola has a toe joint and the, the upper hip joint is tilted against the, both, uh, the other ones. So short introduction into another concept from Norbert called the Acrobot, which is in the hall. Yeah, can you hear me? Yeah, great. Um, so um, before going, getting to the big task of trying to build such a robot, we thought it might be a good idea to start with something simpler. Um, and the idea was to start with something that is, in a way, similar. Um, so we chose the so-called Acrobot. Uh, I will tell you what is similar about the Acrobot in a second. Um, what is the Acrobot? It's a double pendulum where only the middle joint is actuated. And the task is to swing it up. Um, this is a famous toy system from control theory. Why is it similar to... Um, it is similar to a humanoid in the way that it has to track a certain trajectory, so timing matters. If you build a wheeled robot um, and the task is to get from A to B, then it doesn't really matter if it deviates in time. So if it takes one minute and a second rather than a minute, that doesn't matter at all. So your motor controllers can be relatively simple. You just need to apply power to the motors and uh, make sure that you stay in a straight line. But you don't have to track a uh, reference trajectory exactly. This is different for humanoids and it's also different for the acrobot. So this was, a good, uh, this was a good project to get used to build the kind of motor controller that we would later require. Um, very quick, how do we generate a trajectory? It's essentially, we use software. We use a, soft, a code uh, called PSOPT, which is based on a, uh, solving a large-scale constraint nonlinear optimization problem. It's open source. Um, our our, uh, our code, which is very simple, which just um, calculates the equations of motion for the acrobat, is also open. So if you want to, you can have a look. The, the interesting thing is that this is a black box approach. So it doesn't know anything about the acrobat specifically. You just put in the equations of motion, the start position, the goal position, and the so-called cost function, and it generates, if it succeeds, it's an iterative algorithm. So it doesn't always succeed, but if it does succeed, out comes a feasible and locally optimal trajectory, which we then track. Um, for this, we use the so-called LTV AQR uh, regulator. Since the time is progressing, I just ask, uh, ask us if you want to more, know more. Um, we are trying to get a blog post about this Acrobot on our blog. We didn't have time yet. Here's the book. Here's the reference for LTV AQR. Um, again, just ask if you're interested. So now I'll let Felix explain um, the Acrobat hardware. So this is actually tilted by 90 degrees because then it nicely fits with the, any, uh, with the drawing here. Um, the Acrobat consists of two arms, the lower arm and the upper arm, and only the, as uh, Norbert explained, only the center uh, joint is actuated. This one spins freely. Um, yeah, the, the model is in the hall, and uh, we will show everyone or anyone who is interested more. Um, any parts 
uh, are milled or fabricated at uh, uh, Dingverbeurt apart from uh, the pulleys and the aluminium profile itself. Uh, the, all the manufacturing files are on GitHub. So, pictures. Uh, from the manufacturing itself, uh, milling one of the joints, and uh, as time is running, sorry, we um, short introduction, SDM32, we mentioned it in the PCB writer talk, uh, nice ship, 15 bucks, yeah. Uh, again, libopencm3 is the way we go there, uh, and two chain is very good. You can just use standard GCC, standard GDB. Uh, you can even get pre-compiled packages. Um, one more thing uh, is about rotation sensors. Uh, sensors are very important in robotics because you have to know where you are, where your arms are, what the state of your robot is. And we actually use a pretty good resolution sensors on the Acrobot, which are affordable, because one sensor pair is about 15 bucks, which is quite cheap. Um, Alstom Microsystems is the way to go. Uh, the Acrobot has um, five sensors uh, in total, yeah? Incremental here, an absolute uh, one here to sync uh, the zero crossing. Um, then we have an uh, uh, absolute sensor for the uh, BLDC commut uh, um, uh, commutation, and an incremental one here with a light barrier because it's, the ho it's a hollow shaft, and the incremental um, sensors, uh, sorry, the absolute sensors don't work with hollow shafts. Um, so, talking about electronics. Uh, the, those of you who are familiar with Prado copters and RC stuff probably uh, remember Simon K. Um, it's a firmware for all kind of Chinese uh, speed controllers. Um, we, so we bought a cheap uh, controller and thought, hey, maybe we can adapt that. Didn't work out, it's assembly, and we, we are used to this high power arm stuff, and yeah. Um, next approach wa was to just copy everything, but uh, our layout was too big, and yeah. So we just desoldered the ship, and attached some copper wire to our SDM, <laughs> and uh, works out quite well. Uh, everything is working outside in the hall, and once again. Um, if you have any questions regarding building censored uh, brushless drivers, feel free to ask. Uh, next thing here is uh, implementing space vector modulation. It's something like microstepping for step out drivers, but on brushless drivers, and uh, we hope to uh, get rid of the usual snapping you have with brushless drivers, or motors, sorry. And uh, we have to build a better PCB. Uh, this one is a bit hacky, and yeah, just. It works, yeah. So on the motor, as well, cheap brushless, uh, brushless motor from the RC area, um, weights 500 grams with approximately two kilowatts of power. Um, torque is, the calculated torque is three nano, uh, newton meters, sorry. And it's, it's as big as it is because uh, the bigger motors have slower so-called KV value, uh, which just says how fast the motor will be without load with a certain voltage. Yeah, so gears again. Gears are pretty expensive. Uh, a typical harmonic drive is about 1,500 euros. We have six degrees of freedom per leg. Do the math, math yourself, it's pretty damn expensive. So, the, and the idea is to use planetary gears, but there is a big uncertainty, bad leash. And um, we, we think about using uh, motors from, uh, uh, or, uh, sorry, gears from uh, cordless screwdrivers because they usually claim to, to be in the area of 90 Newton meters for better <laughs> screwdrivers, which is in the ballpark we need them. And um, therefore, we, we plan, the next step is to build a motor test bed, which is just a big extrusion profile, one meter, with 10 kilograms of 
plumbum at the end. So equations, whatever. We hope we are able to kill all the gears we ever buy and uh, see whether they are, are suitable. So that brings us back to robots. Our goal is to, to build a robot that is approximately one, meter, uh, approximately one meter 20 high, but with a short torso, so we focus on the legs. Um, for the weight, approximately 30 kilograms, but we could downsize everything if our gears aren't suitable because the, the needed torque reduces with the size and the, uh, and the weight. And the speed, uh, the, the, sorry, the, um, the goal is to implement dynamic walking on uh, like a human gait on, on this robot and with a speed that is com uh, comparable to a human at the same leg size than the robot has. So the current status is we have the Acrobat, which hardware-wise works. Software isn't quite ready yet, unfortunately. We have a simulation, but I think time is running out. And um, after the, the testbed is built, which is the next steps, uh, because all parts are ready, all, everything is lying uh, prepared for the testbed, we find a suitable motor gear combination and um, we hope to have some prototype lag ready towards the end of this or the beginning of next year. So, that's it. Uh, thank you for your attention. Thank you. Um, we are in the hall, as I said, five times now. Uh, we have a blog at xrp.org with a wiki that is yeah, it's quite nice if you want to get into Acrobot, into optimization problems, in, uh, to get an overview of uh, a biped walking or a brushless, uh, sen uh, sensor-based brushless drivers. Um, yeah, any questions? Oh. Uh, <laughs> any questions in the hall, please? Uh, we, we answer them twice, no problem. So, um...